Chapter 4. Burlam arrives at work and receives instructions. Burlam had forgotten about the Gravender Bomb Festival. He and his fellow caretakers had been reminded on Friday that it was taking place over the weekend, but Burlam, occupied with his own thoughts and obsessions about identity, hadn't paid any attention. When he arrived at work on the Monday morning following the festival, therefore, he was shocked at the sight of trash strewn everywhere on the grounds about the perfectual. He would have been shocked even if he had remembered the festival, for the state of the grounds was far worse than in years past. The Gravender Bum Festival had been growing in size every year, but this year it seemed to have taken, taken an exponential leap in attendance and intensity. Something will have to be done about this before next year, Pi and the supervisor promised. In the meantime, he instructed, they would have to get started cleaning everything up. Access to the interior of the perfectual, normally unhindered to the public, had been restricted on Saturday to only a few people at a time, which accounted for the relatively clean state of the interior. Cohen, who was in charge on Saturdays, had cleverly and unethically put up phony notices stating that the restrooms were out of order. Bet that pissed those hippies off, Ned chuckled. Lou disagreed. They don't care. They just shit outside. Pine cocked his head and looked sternly at Lou. Isn't it the responsibility of the Municipal Department of Sanitation to pick up the trash, Vike objected? We're not technically responsible for that kind of maintenance. We are responsible for the grounds immediately around the perfectual, Pine countered, and that's what I want you to, to attend to. He couldn't stand Vike. The man was a complainer, always ready to find some excuse for not doing something. But that's it, right? Burlam interjected, hoping to defuse any confrontation. We just clean up our area and let the city take care of the paths and the grounds further up down the hill. Yes, Pine nodded. As the men headed outside to begin the cleanup, Vike continued with, it, continued with his objections. This is bullshit, he declared. The city ought to make the festival organizers pay a fee to hire the necessary extra staff to clean up after them. Ned went further. They ought to cancel the whole thing forever, he said. They can't do that, Berlin told them, or they won't anyway. First of all, they need the money generated by all those people coming to town. Vike and Lou looked at Berlin expectantly. That's it, he decided, unable to think of a second reason. The men headed to the storage sheds behind the monument where the trash bags were kept. The city's going to have to come by here with oversized trash containers anyway, Ned pointed out, or send extra trash trucks. They might as well provide portable toilets. Maybe they will next year, Burlam turned and sighed heavily at the sight of countless food wrappers, liquor bottles, diapers, discarded clothing, styrofoam coolers, and indeterminate paper ephemera. Well, you t I'll tell you one thing, Vike lit a cigarette and surveyed the scene with one hand on his hip. I'm not picking up any shit, human or otherwise. Despite his attitude, Bur Burlam liked Vike. He could be very amusing at times. He had a seemingly inexhaustible fund of stories about his youth. The festival is described. Those of you unfamiliar with the Gravender Bum Festival should first of all imagine something like the atmosphere surrounding a Grateful Dead concert or one of the numerous Woodstock revivals, only without the music. Without the music, you ask incredulously, how can that be? Simply put, the neo-hippies who attend the Gravender Bum Festival are modern, technologically savvy people. They each carry a personal music device and headphones or earbuds or whatever sound entrenching tool is preferred that can be linked to those cared by other attendees based on proximity and the democratic process. Is. The only noises an observer wandering through the festival is bound to hear are those of last laughter, frisbees striking various objects, and people fornicating in the grass. Although not sanctioned by the board of directors of the Prefectural, the festival is yet centered about it. And although centered about the actual Prefectural itself, the festival actually takes place over the whole of the monument's district. Ostensibly, the festival goers are there to celebrate the ideals embodied by the Prefectural, although it is hard to see how throwing trash all over the place fits in with those ideals. Gravender Bum, named after a character in the independent comic book Colossor May Drink, found its origins in the informal salon of Renegade Poetry Legion, a deliberately amateur band whose members all felt strongly in the ethic of self-realization through contrariness. Al Flam Flamidchip, one of the members, dreamed of the idea for a convention of people who liked Colossor May Drink, the music of Japanese noise artist tab Tabasketry, soft narcotics like Aspercut and can Cannabubble, and the television series Bloodsoe's Bedsore. It was his band Mate Bert Loink, who incorporated the festivals, who incorporated the central symbology of the perfectual. It's so corny. It just feels right. He enthused as the band and their compatriots from the local theater and comics community, costing themselves as medieval cowboys from the collective mythology. As the festival grew in popularity, it was important to the core of its guidance assembly that its founding principles not be lost amid the hedonism and technological interplay. 
We should at the very least insist that an opening speech be made, Flamichip suggested, one that recapitulates the overall mission of the festival and lays out that year's festival's theme. They all nodded in agreement as they passed the bag of Aspercut among themselves. Yes, it should be nominally structured, but kept as free form as possible. I don't want this thing to get too commercial. It was Bobby, the drummer and claymation artist, who said this. His girlfriend, sitting beside him on her throne, grunted her approval. I don't want it to get commercial at all, Lemick added. I don't want it to get rich and famous. Certainly not famous. Several of those present shuddered at the thought. These children of tomorrow had seen what fame can do to a life. Of course, they all wanted the requisite funds to manifest their artistic ambitions, but the, but the political pressures of a wealthy man's wallet were equally well known to them through the digital nervous system. This world may not be the one I, and you maybe, wanted to grow up in, but for them it was the only world they had ever known. We'll need some kind of symbol for the festival, a girl's voice in the back pointed out. I think the image of the wishbone inside the perfectual is something we can all agree has deep meaning. Flemingship was groovy and wise. One of the festival goers is profiled. Eager Maneuver had never been to the Gravender Bomb Festival before. He had first heard about it just after the previous year's festival had ended. The news reports, which had made the whole thing sound like an almost criminal waste of time, had only served to excite his imagination. He had already begun to grow his hair out in celebration of the beginning of his college years. Now he started to grow his beard as well. I'm going to the Brick Gravender Bum Festival, he told a friend. What for? the friend, the committed goth, begged. To be, a, to be among others of my kind. The goth, somewhat hurt by this, encouraged him to cut his hair, dye it black, and join him in a black box full of stroboscopic lights and jackhammer beats and dance, dance, dance. There's more to art than dancing, Eager counted. Don't I know it, the goth thought in reply. Images of coffee and vinyl pants dominated, dominated the little screen just behind his forehead. I mean doing interesting things with construction paper and glue. Eager shook his head at his friend's failure to understand that this was more than just some ersatz hippie thing. This is about the rejection of manufactured entertainment. But what about the synchronized personal digi digital music players, his friend asked. Oh yes, I've read about them. Eager Maneuver said nothing. He merely gathered his homemade comic books and hand-drawn t-shirts and headed for the door. No one understood if even a goth didn't understand. Of course, this same goth also puzzled over the con continuing popularity of the preppy look. Outside, Eager's girlfriend, dressed as a mechanical prehistorical, prehistoric killer bird, waited. What do you think your parents will think, she asked as he joined her in the old van. I am no longer concerned with what Tom and Veronica, Veronica think, Eager decided. He was even more forthcoming during an interview with Morse Wrig Wrigley of Action News Section. He was even more forthcoming during an interview with Morse Wrigley of Action 6 News as he walked across the grocery store parking lot in which he had left his van. I am not concerned about leaving my van here. First of all, as I fully intend to purchase a number of items in the store before heading up to the perfectual, I count myself as a customer of the store and am therefore entitled to park here. Second, a person who would have to be a mighty low to tote away or tamper with another person's home, which is how I consider my van, at least for the time being. I mean, you can sleep in it after all. Yes, but does it have toilet facilities, reporter Wrigley demanded, pushing a microphone into the young man's face. Eager glanced at his girlfriend, whose mouth was set in a grim line. There are some things we don't discuss in public, he replied. Everyone we've talked to today heading to the festival seems to have some specialty, whether it be macrame, making musical instruments out of old children's toys, or just throwing a frisbee around. Do you have a specialty that you bring to this weekend's gathering? Yes, I do, Morse. Eager looked, looked into the camera. I make miniature villages out of paper. I play the piano, his girlfriend interjected. Wrigley could be seen to glance at the camera himself. Do you have a piano with you, perhaps in the van, he asked. No more questions, Eager declared. We have gum to buy. Berlin picks up gar garbage. Berlin was amazed at the number of coloring books he found. True, it was nothing compared to the number of beer bottles, but still, one would think that having spent the time to fill a coloring book in, one would want to take it home. Were the people attending the festival so absent-minded from drug consumption that they simply couldn't keep track of their belongings? It could be, since he and his co-workers found such items as strollers, roller skates, and curling irons abandoned amid the debris. The coloring books fascinated Berlin. Some were typical productions featuring characters like Batman, Ecology, Owl, and Jesus, but many seemed to be, have been made specifically with the festival goer in mind. One was titled Easy Elf Payments in a Cylinder. It depicted the, the perfectual as a living mobile being with two legs and two arms and a stern face made of the stones that comprised its walls. Two windows non-existent on the actual structure served as eyes. 
This cartoon perfectual had a number of encounters with historical figures like Johnny Appleseed and Helen Keller, each captioned below in succinct, in succinct coloring book style. The perfectual helps Robin Hood make pancakes. Berlin wondered how the publishers of these books could get away with such infringement. Was it because the imagery of a famous building was not copyrighted and protected? After all, the Eiffel Tower and the Taj Mahal could be freely depicted in any form whatsoever. But the Perfectual was solely owned by the Perfectual Trust. He would have to look into the matter later, although he didn't want to start any trouble. He just felt loyalty to his employers. How much did he really identify with the Perfectual itself and the ideas it was supposed to represent? It seemed that he had memorized, but not internalized, the Perfectual Creed. He tucked a couple of half-completed and bizarrely colored at that books into the back of his pants. Gradually, the bags filled up, full of garbage piled up. Burlam found Vike seated on the, on the ground behind one especially large pile, smoking a cigarette. Take a load off your feet, Vike hailed Burlam. The latter looked about cautiously before hunching his shoulders and quickly joining his co-worker below the perfective, protective refuse. He didn't sit, ha sit down, however, but only squatted. You look like you're trying to take a shit, Vike joked. I'm afraid Pine will be out here taking a look around, Burlam explained his anxiety. Shit. Vike dismissed the younger man's concerns. He's not going to dirty his hands by coming out here. Besides, he's too busy filling out forms. I think you're right, Burlam said after a moment. The city is going to have to start charging the festival organizers a big fee every year. He gestured at the wall of garbage bags between them and the perfectual. Or stop them coming up here, Mike added. Well, they can't do that, Burlam pointed out. The whole point of the festival is to, of the festival is to perfectual. Mike's eyes narrowed. Are you into all this, he asked, nodding at the idea of the Gravender Bum Festival, evident all around them. Burlam considered. No, he decided. I'm a little too old for this kind of group activity. But I'm sympathetic, he added quickly. I think it's stupid. Vike painfully raised himself to his feet. He picked up an empty trash bag and headed down the hill. Burlam wondered how much longer it would be until he retired. Disapproval is registered. As much as Burlam sympathized with the festival, the festival goers, and or their intentions, he was thoroughly disgusted with their behavior by the time he clocked out for lunch. In a peak, he wrote a letter to the mayor of Wankins demanding that something be done about the situation before it happened again. He was later to mail the letter, having taken 24 hours to consider the ramifications of his doing so. Another 24 hours after that, the letter arrived at the mayor's office. Here's another letter about the festival, one of the secretaries at the office announced as she opened Burlam's missive. This one is... Is. She took time to scan it against, she decided, then tossed it into the appropriate pile. What's the ratio? Mayor Falcoy put his head in the door and asked. Um, Secretary Sally took a moment to estimate the relative sizes of the piles. I'd say three to one against. Falcoy pursed his lips and nodded. He withdrew his head and shut the door. Bradley, he addressed his executive assistant who was reading one of the letters, I want you to pick out the three best letters against the festival and select the relevant passages from them. What about the ones for? Bradley, slim and possessed of wavy dark locks of abundant hair like a sea of mushroom gravy tossed about in a stroboscopic storm, gestured to a handful of letters on the table adjacent to his crossed ankles. I think we can dismiss those as the work of festival organizers or their dupes, Falcoy answered, seating himself at his desk. He was a portly man. His bald head looked like the friendly end of a butternut squash. He often not thought about the tribesmen of the mountains of New Guinea, for whom baldness was, an un was as unknown as arteri arteriosclerosis. What a paradise, he thought. It might be worth eating bugs to live such a life. That's demonstrably false, replied the young man. I've seen at least two this morning from, from residents of Wankins who wholeheartedly approve of the festival, the money it brings into the city, and the general belief system expressed by it. Belief system, Falcor repeated incredulously. Give me a break, Bradley. The only thing that hippies believe in is avoiding the responsibilities of life. But what about expressing oneself through non-commercial means? What about handcrafting your own fun instead of buying something? Falcoy's ma mouth gasped, gaped. And you claim they bring a significant amount of money to the area, he said sarcastically, flapping his hands at the ends of his sleeves. I'm not claiming anything. You seem sympathetic to their cause. Oh, no, the young man shook his head emphatically. Going about unwashed and out of step with fashion is not my thing. I'm merely playing devil devil's advocate on the one hand and quoting our own statistics on the economic impact of the festival on the other. What about the ecological impact, the, the mayor demanded. Do you have enough hands to weigh that? That's the side of this issue that you'd think these people would hold close to their hearts. Bradley made a face as if admitting some truth in this statement, but at the same time asserting that there, were, that there was more to the situation than such a statement conveyed. 
They are not really traditional hippies, he told the mayor, making quotation marks in the air with his perfectly manicured, manicured fingertips. Can the ideals of the, of the perfectual and the goals of the festival be reconciled? The last thing we want to see is this festival shut down. This assertion was made by one of the old men on the Perfectual's Board of Governors. These old men were gathered at the secret headquarters of the Perfectual Trust in a large city far to the north. north. Why not? Another old man demanded. There are plenty of other conventions, festivals, and special gatherings that bring visitors to Wankins and therefore increase per attendance at the Perfectual. A third old man, this one wearing the burgundy sports coat of a lawn bowling enthusiast, inter interjected, Yes, but this festival, this... He consulted a piece of paper before him. Gravender Bum Festival makes a direct correlation between the perfectual itself, its ideals and symbolism, and those of the festival. It's a vindication, a grassroots cry of approval for all that we stand for. One of the others snorted in mockery of this. He threw himself back in his chair and stared at the high, dark corner of the room. You don't agree, the third old man wondered, eyes agog behind his glasses. Why don't we just start our own festival, the youngest man in the room, one just past 60, 60 years old, asked his colleagues, attempting to lead the discussion into productive avenues. What, a festival specifically for and about the perfectual, the first old man asked. Well, why not? Eyebrows were raised, lower lips pushed in and out, fingers flexed. Well, the easy answer to that is that it would seem to be a validation on our part of what these Gravender Bum people are doing. Not if they were shut down. That would make it doubly obvious what we are doing. No, what we really need is some way to incorporate the festival into the, into the perfectual sphere of influence without... The old man paused, unsure of how to continue. That is sheer crazy talk. The old man directly across the table jumped in. The festival re represents anarchy, for lack of a better word, while the perfectual represents tradition. The old man and the short beard so beloved of English academ academ academicians interrupted. Gentlemen, we have, become, have we become so hidebound, he continued, looking around at his colleagues, so attached to what we think the perfectual means that we've forgotten the founding principles behind it? I know exactly what the perfectual means, one old man insisted, even as his mind was more focused on what he would be having for dinner that night. It means the primacy of the individual, and the necessity of the individual pursuing his own self-realization through a total commitment to the primacy of his individuality. He moved his fingers across the circle of the table as he made his points, coming back to where he started. A circle. There was silence for some moments as the old man measured these words. Succinctly put, one of them finally said. Yes, I had the youngest of them, but I still don't see how that rather neatly summarized philosophy is incompatible with the ideals of this festival. <laughs> because the festival is a mass amusement celebrating triviality. I don't see that. You don't? No, because their whole message is do your own thing. My friend, the only true way to do your own thing is to do it in the security of your own solitude. It may seem less brave than doing it in the company of thousands, but it's the only way to assure yourself of personal fidelity. A local tomb of some celebrity. At the foot of the hill the perfectual stood on was a series of tombs. One of these, which had received nearly as much attention from the, from the festival goers as the perfectual itself, was that of Frank Elephant, a, music and, a musician and filmmaker who had died some dozen years before. As in the case of the, of the Perfectual, this attention was evident in the amount of garbage strewn about the, the tomb. Some people had even gone so far as writing the words to some of Elephant's songs in crayon on the door to the tomb. The unusual thing about Frank Elephant's tomb, explained the caretaker to a crayon removal specialist brought in to deal with the graffiti, is that there is more than just one. Oh, yes, he continued as the specialist selected tools from the case. There are four tombs, and the caretaker leaned closer to the other man's ear. No one is sure at any given moment which one contains Frank Elephant's body. As the man squatting before the tomb door seemed not to be paying the slightest notice to the caretaker's words, the caretaker tilted his head to one side and gazed into the sky. In into the sky. You see, he lectured, Elephant's followers move the body from tomb to tomb on significant dates of the year, anniversaries of important happenings in the great man's life and the like. This tomb, the one you're working on here before you, is called Tomb Number 2 in the Referenda. Number 1 is in Hollywood, number 3 is in London, and number 4 is in the desert outside Mokthanus Flats. There's, there was a rumor for years of a fifth tomb in New York City, but that has been thoroughly debunked by socialist, by socialist researchers working for Fumbly's Proviso. 
Can you hold this for a moment? The highly paid workman finally spoke. He handed the caretaker a length of tubing that coiled down into a large ceramic flask. Oh, sure. The caretaker, an older man with a barrel-like torso, took the tubing in his soft pink hands and watched, waited, watched to see what would happen. The tomb itself, as the caretaker would gladly have pointed out, had he been given, given, given an opening, was made of locally quarried semi-flawless blue granite. It stood nine feet high and was shaped much like a traditional doghouse. The doorway, the doorway was even rounded on top like the entrance to a doghouse. Dog In order to facilitate the regular movement of the body, the door was made not of stone, but of varnished oak bound with wrought iron bands. Over the door was the name Elephant carved in relief. Running vertically along either side of the doorway were car carved various symbols associated with Frank Elephant's life and career. These included a telephone with a snake-headed receiver, a wallet containing only a condom and a union membership card, a representation of the censorship of the, of the censorship beep, and an elephant whose trunk tip was actually a postage cancellation device. I am not familiar with the work of Frank Elephant, the caretaker confessed with the same tone he used at the grocery store to indicate that he did not eat frosted flakes. He was a genius, the crayon removal specialist stated. He got to his feet and pressed his hands to the small of his back. You're not done, the interrogative words, are you, were implied. I've got to get something out of my truck, the workman started to walk away. What about this, the caretaker indicated, indicated the tube he held. You can put it down, the other man said over his shoulder. As the minutes passed, the old caretaker began studying the employees of the various monuments divisions moving about picking up trash. There aren't as many women working now as I would have predicted 20 years ago, he thought. He determined to tell the workman this when he lit when the latter returned. Burlam finds something. The basic cleanup was completed about an hour and a half after lunch. As Burlam dragged his last bag of refuse to the pickup point, he noticed something in the grass. He picked it up and examined it. Burlam didn't know it, but this was a highly collectible toy figure from the early 1970s. It was a blue plastic businessman, about two and a half inches tall, made in the same way that the more familiar little green army men are made. He, he stood on a rectangular base and held a briefcase. He was all that was left of a group of blue plastic figures that were made to wait in line for a city bus, including the original playset. The businessman, whose name was Roy Turnipseed, worked for Moloch, Molochsick, a large toy manufacturer whose subsidiaries were like tentacles spread throughout the world of crafters and hobbyists, as well as that, as that of entertainment. As Roy waited for the bus, he thought about the secret formula in his briefcase. Wouldn't old Harrison be surprised when he saw the fancy presentation in which it had been packaged? The woman behind Roy at the bus stop appeared to be a typical secretary, pretty, young, and competent. Roy, Roy glanced sur Roy glanced surreptitiously at her while pretending to scan the street for the bus. What would she say if he was to tell her about the secret, secret formula? You mean like for rocket fuel or something? She wondered, smiling up at the tall, square-jawed man of business. Oh, much more valuable than that, he replied, his voice deep and authoritative, at least to the children of America. I don't know, the young woman, dressed in a miniskirt and silk blouse, demurred. Every child is interested in the space program. Hardly every child, Roy countered. He didn't say it, but he was thinking about girls. Surely they weren't interested in space. The handsome, brave astronauts, perhaps, but not the dynamics of trajectory, nor the technical details of capsule life. No, talking to her would be unproductive, decided Roy. The other typical city characters lining the sidewalk were an older businessman whose increased girth suggested a higher position in the corporate hierarchy. What he was doing waiting for a bus was unknown. Did the secret formula have some bearing on this odd situation? A housewife in town either to do some shopping or attend a matinee performance of some innocuous play. A black man sporting an enormous afro. An anachronistic newsboy complete with newsboy hat and short pants. And a crocodile hidden in a trench coat and fedora. The scene was completed when the bus arrived and the driver stepped out to argue with the traffic cop about urban renewal. Roy Turnipseed clutched his briefcase closer. Where was the construction worker with his hard hat and metal lunchbox, he wondered. Suspicion dominated his little plastic head, chewed beyond recognition by a child for whom the playset was slightly too advanced. No wonder all the pieces were lost except for Roy, desperate to get on the bus and take a seat. Do you have the secret formula? Har Harrison later asked. Yes, sir. The businessman opened his briefcase and extracted the leather folder containing that upon which the hopes of many a child and man rode. He placed it on Harrison's desk. Harrison, bearded and, be and, bearded and bespectacled, may not have looked like the typical captain of industry, but he knew the significance of what he saw before him. E equals MC squared, he read aloud. That's the secret formula? Yes, sir, affirmed Roy with a jerk of his head. It will be printed on the back of the tile hidden in the monkey's lair. 
Who built the perfectual? The question has been asked, who built the perfectual? Even many, if not most, of those who live in wagons do not know. It seems to be a relic from antiquity, mysterious and forbidding. Some people don't even, won't even gaze in the direction of the monuments region for fear of seeing that dark tower looming, looming over all. Now, if you want to know who actually built the perfectual, that is, who actually dug the foundations and laid the stones, that information is readily available. Styrico Sudsi, a local construction company, was contracted to do the work. Some of the men who worked on the site, from the masonry to the installation of the Great Staircase, are still alive. However, who hired Styrico Sudsi? It is widely known that the Prefectural is run by the Prefectural Trust, which in turn is guided by the Board of Governors. But according to spokespeople for the Trust, as well as those members of the Board who have found themselves on the hostile end of a microphone, the Trust is just a machine set in motion by the original founders, of whom they claim to have no knowledge. This is nothing more than a shop-worn fiction at this point, however, for we all know that a trio of businessmen, Mark Jr., Holtz Crowder, and Jeremy Sponge, plan planned and financed the Perfectual's construction following their encounter with the legendary holy man Yamasek Nam Liam Totar in the late 1950s. Of course, this is all revealed in my history of the Perfectual, inadequately shielded by the pew, but as no publisher has any intention of mass-producing the book, its contents remain the privilege of only a few close friends. One may well ask, have these close friends actually read the whole book? I can only say that they say they have. I don't have the nerve to press the issue to test them, to ask them something like, well, what did you think of the scene in which Tom finds the remains of his steak dinner in the trash next morning, to see if they really read it? I don't want to seem like a, like a pushy crank, some would-be writer whose work is too esoteric for the average reader, but who desperately longs to receive meaningful feedback from, from a total stranger. No, I don't want to know exactly, I don't, know, I don't want to know what these close friends really think. The truth is I'm going to write exactly what I want regardless of whether anyone reads it or not, or what some boo-stocking bitch in an office somewhere finds acceptable as a literature. As Yamosak said, your failure to identify with the main character is the fault of deceptive marketing. When he said that in the lecture of 1955, his words were heeded by only a handful of beatniks, seekers, theosophist holdovers, and three businessmen who were at the forefront of the analog computer revolution. Their innovation, replacing the punch card with translucent screens covered with random blobs of ink, went nowhere. But by skillfully manipulating investors in the scheme, they were able to retire early, each a multimillionaire. They agreed that they owed their success to the philosophy imparted to them by the little man with the long beard and funny clothes. Their first attempt at paying tribute to him, in the form of a line of breakfast cereals and soaps known as heteronymics, was a failure. But the second, conceived after a bizarre ceremony high atop the metropolitan Wolkenkratzer, what, Wolkenkratzer was the perfectual. I have, after years of laborious digging, discovered that the architect of the use of the project was Per Omarsson. This man, a disciple of both Ulrich Franson and Jacques Quell, was paid well to keep his involvement secret. The trio need not have bothered. He later disowned the design, having entered the mature phase of his career. A career, by the way, that led him into mentoring the young Hale Mephiticus. But where did the wishbone artifact inside the perfectual come from? This remains a mystery, even to me. Berlin hopes it never happens again. At the end of the day, Berlin wearily climbed aboard the tram, hoping that he'd never have to go through such an experience again. It was like a battlefield, he, commended, he commented as he and some of the other caretakers discussed the aftermath of the festival. Have you ever been on the battlefield? An older fellow named Reese asked Berlin with contempt coiled inside his words like a bright orange snake. Berlin took time to draw his breath, to draw breath. No, he replied. He had planted menace of his own in the reply, lest Reese think that he could hold his veteran status over Burlam's imagery like a hammer of seniority. Reese's mouth wrinkled in mute dismissal. He had made his point. He looked away. If a man has never handled a dead body, then he has no business making any such comparisons. Burlam turned his attention to the conversation of the other men. He longed to throw his reasoned pacifism in the older man's face, but he didn't want to make a stink. Who knew? But everyone around probably sympathized with Reese's blind, right-wing stupidity. I found ten dollars, one man said. Did you really? Did you turn it in? What do you think? I found a perfectly good tennis racket, another man informed everyone. You play tennis? No, but somebody might. Burlum touched the little blue man through the material of his shirt pocket. I found this, he wanted to say, but held himself back. At home, he walked with a heavy tread up the steps to, this, to the front door. You look beat, Niagara commented with, a, commented with a smile. I am. Burlam took off his hat and hung it on a peg by the doorway. Hard day? Yeah, it was pretty hard. 
but it was dispiriting more than anything. What happened? Burlam told her all about it. He was still talking about it. At, uh, he was still talking about it as they ate dinner. Are you going to mail that letter to the mayor? Niagara asked. I'm thinking about it. Well, I think it's disgraceful. People who claim to have such high-minded ideals leaving the grounds in such a state. Niagara was vehement, yet her forehead was unlined. Burlam stared at the centerpiece on the table, a collection of flowers from the backyard in a blue vase. Oh, that reminds me, he suddenly came out of his reverie. I found something while cleaning up. Where's that shirt I wore today? In the laundry room. Burlam retrieved his shirt from the hamper and removed the toy businessman. Niagara chuckled in delight. What are you going to do with it, she asked. Put it in my curio rack. Niagara followed Burlam to the living room, where a small rack full of items Burlam had collected over the years hung next to a, pic to a picture of Venice. The rack was in the shape of the outline of a house. Burlam placed the blue man in between a glass, glass rooster and a tiny German submarine.